afternoon folks hey i was uh i i, I want to begin by saying i was just absolutely blown away by a whole bunch of responses that came back on this quiz deal that i put out for the blockchain um so there was some answers that came back that were pretty staggering to me there was a lot of answers that came back that were just absolutely spot on on simply just describing what this beast called blockchain is um, there were some folks that did a really really good job of tying it back into how is this helping with the whole notion of precision agriculture um, I got to be honest with you I had a uh, I had an assignment ready to go and in the can um, pursuant to you know, kind of a part two for this or, or a next part of the quiz. Um, so th this was just fascinating to me that after I read through these, um, a lot of the questions I was ready to ask you weren't necessarily what you folks were angling at. Um, the more I thought about it, the more I decided, okay, look, let's go with the direction you folks took. Um, I will just lay it out the the difference I had between where I saw this going and what you um, came back to me with. Uh, number one, it was pretty cool, and I'm actually going to ask you some questions and ask you folks to write a little bit about some of the differences I saw coming into this and what you came back to me with. Um, from the perspective I came at it from about what is the blockchain and what can we as producers get out of blockchain, um, I really expected to hear way more about um, protecting yourself or, or gathering information or data for yourself about what the value of your commodity is. And, and trying to gain more perfect um, understanding of what you can price your commodity uh, leaving your farm gate. And in point of fact, there's only one or two of you that kind of briefly mentioned that. One of the major themes that I did pick up on, um, and I'm going to show you a couple examples as we go through this, um, there was a whole lot of effort and thought process coming from you about um, either creating transparency in the market so our customers or our end consumers can see what exactly and and when I say exactly I mean exactly and precisely what went into producing that commodity um, we, there was some discussion from a couple of people about uh, food safety and recalls um, and uh, a lot of um, comments about look our con our customers are looking for and the big term is going to be traceability on this on this product whatever it is whether it be a head of lettuce a calf uh, a bushel of wheat um, they want to know where it came from and what went into producing that. Um, that was really interesting that I found that uh, almost to a person that came back, you were super into providing that information to your customers. So that was cool. Um, I am going to go ahead and ask a couple of questions about the security of of what the blockchain is. There's one or two of you that discuss that a little bit. Um, I'm, I might ask a few more questions that are pertaining to who can participate and uh, maybe drill down a little bit further about the notion of manipulating data. Um, but uh, on the other hand, a lot of you hit the nail right on the head about how secure a blockchain is and where it's actually at. And there, there's one student that answered that question about where is the blockchain out and, and almost entirely turned that question on its head and I'm pretty excited to show you that answer just so you, you folks can I think it's going to give a, an incredible amount of insight and um, 
give you a different way to think about this maybe. So um, I'm going to start with this student right here, and <coughs> I'm doing the best I can to block everybody's name out, and I, I also intentionally didn't um, put any grades up here, so I, I, I don't want to air anybody's laundry like that, but um, there were some pretty good answers coming along. So this student used wheat um, perfect. Uh, I, I, I think wheat's probably got one of the blockchains being started right now that's probably more advanced than a lot of other uh, others out there. Um, a large part of that's just because there are some major players in that game. Um, wheat's obviously a commodity that we trade a lot in in the United States. Um, the bigger and the more money, the more precision that's going to be brought to bear on it. Um, so I, I think wheat was a pretty cool one to look into. So um, I, I think this was also a pretty good uh, definition of what the heck is a blockchain. So just want to go through that real quick. A blockchain for the wheat industry is a ledger technology. At its very core, that's exactly and precisely what uh, a blockchain is. It's nothing more than basically an Excel spreadsheet that shows what it is, what happened to it, when. Um, but as we look into this, we can add more and more and more data to it. But at its very core, it's nothing more than just a ledger, and we're throwing some technology at it. Um, so here's the key point. It's shared between many entities. Um, a lot of you went ahead and, and said that there are different types of blockchains. We've got the public ones. That's probably the one you've seen the most. So the big low-hanging fruit example on that one is just going to be Bitcoin. Um, so public ledger, anybody who, uh, and somebody did identify, you got to have a computer that's actually good enough to uh, buy into this. Uh, sorry, buy in is the wrong term. As long as you got enough of a computer to read all the data, you can see what's going on in that blockchain. You, you can't necessarily participate, but you can sure watch what's happening. Um, so the, and they're all going to operate on the same network. So these computers or devices are speaking to each other all the time. Um, one thing that probably ought to make clear right now is that every computer or node on this blockchain that is participating has a copy and a real-time copy of what is happening inside of this blockchain. That means that no single user, if they get some sort of horrible computer virus, uh, worm, something like that. If the data gets corrupted on one node, no problem. I, I mean, sorry for that one person. I, I, I apologize for the computer problems you're having. That sucks. But that data is digitally living on every device that is viewing or participating in that blockchain. Um, if we really drill down into it, as long as there is 50% plus one of the participants in this blockchain that do not have corrupted data, the data is fine. Um, at its very core, when we start looking at the computer programming part of it, what makes this so com this so secure? is the fact that as long as the majority of the nodes within this blockchain agree, that's the way the blockchain is going to go. Um, so another way to put that is, is if you're trying to be dishonest with this, and we'll use Bitcoin for the example real quick, if somebody's trying to steal Bitcoin, they would have to corrupt the data on over 50% of the computers. That's a pretty tall order. Um, there may be groups of computer hackers out there that could get that done. There's been plenty try. It's been successful one time. Um, also, we're learning as we go. Um, it's 
not very likely that you could corrupt data on more than half of the participants in the blockchain. Um, okay, so that's the same network part. Um, the whole point of this blockchain, well, I'll save that, but it comes up in the next question, but um, what this is going to be able to do for you, I, I like this definition right there, from harvest all the way to the consumer. So we can track what's happening on whatever that commodity is, and, and shoot money's just as good as um, fertilizer or wheat or cattle. So, yeah, and every place along the entire chain of events, um, maybe even before they actually began in the planning stages, we can start adding a block to this chain of sequences and chain of data sets that's going to add more information to it. So it's like building a Lego set. You've got these big, huge blocks of information like this student planted 1,000 acres of wheat in XYZ field. Now, either somebody else who's participating in this blockchain or that farmer can go ahead and say, okay, I've got this block. It's 1,000 acres a week. Then the seed grower can say, yeah, I sold the seed to this person, and we have XYZ variety of wheat. We can start adding blocks that this is GMO wheat or this is non-GMO wheat. Um, we can start adding information or data or putting another little Lego into that block that says, okay, it was farmed this way or that way. We start adding all this data, and now we can start sorting this data. Or the other way to put it is I can start sorting this wheat and say, okay, the wheat here fits a certain set of criteria that a certain customer wants. So um, there you go. There's the first part about what is a block. Next question, I thought the student did a pretty good job there, is uh, how does it work? Um, the start of the blockchain, this student said it's at harvest time. Um, I mean, it's good enough, great. If that's what wheat's doing, perfect. Um, otherwise, you, you can actually back it up to long before then and start start your blocks there. Um, the, the point being is, is that these blocks are a sequenced set of events that have a timestamp associated with them. Um, the farmer gives a way to certify his product, usually with some sort of a barcode. Okay, so uh, correct on that. Um, barcode is the technology that pretty much everybody's got. And the reason why is everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket. You can take a picture of a barcode, and now all of a sudden that's digital data that's probably live and hot, hot linked in somewhere else. Um, we're using barcodes right now because it's handy. Um, there's definitely going to become the day where we start using radio frequency chips. Um, in fact, those are on the news all the time. You hear about somebody hanging one of these little uh, Apple trackers on somebody's luggage, and you can see where their flight went. Um, yeah, I, I mean, somebody's using that for nefarious purposes right now, but the technology already exists that we can start actually hanging physical trackers on stuff and watch it through the chain that way. Um, I don't know that that's practical for a bushel of wheat, but we can certainly apply that exact same technology. Um, it, it may be writ on a larger scale or even a much, much smaller scale, depending upon what our end user actually wants and the participants that are in this blockchain actually want. Um, we, we now have the freedom of movement to go ahead and do it. Um, but this student was basically saying, hey, this has given me a way to track that bushel of wheat all the way through the process. So basically that bushel of wheat jumped into a combine, then it jumped into a truck, then it fell out of the truck um, right after it went over a set of scales into the elevator. Then it sat in the elevator for a while. Now we know where that bushel of wheat is. We know what it is and, and a whole bunch of the circumstance that went into it. And eventually that bushel of wheat's going to jump onto a barge or into a rail car and it's going to wind up at a shipper or a, a terminal port where it's going to get on another big boat and wind up in Pakistan, for example. And we can start adding data to this 
all along and we've got this sequential set of events. One of the things that I didn't necessarily hear from anybody in particular was the fact that in order for data to appear on that blockchain, there has to be two people agree, two users or participants agree that this happened. Now, the way that's going to happen in agriculture a lot of the time is, okay, your fertilizer dealer agrees that they sold you X many semi-loads of NH3 fertilizer. Okay, and I was just using that because it's going to come up in an example in just a minute. Um, so, yeah, you, the buyer and seller, agreed to that. So, you can go ahead and plug that little block into the chain. Um, pretty simple that way. I think that's one of the things that we need to have a question about um, moving forward on this one. Okay, um, where is this blockchain? Um, I'm going to give you a couple answers that are going to look very, very similar, but I had one student that came back with an answer for where is this blockchain um, that is going to look really different, and I thought it was a cool answer, but Anyways, here, here's one that goes along the lines of what you're going to read on the internet about where is blockchain. Um, it's shared by several entities operating on the same network. So that's one, that's one way to very politely say it's living on all of these computers and it's living on the cloud and it's living wherever data storage is at or data storage of participants in that blockchain. So it doesn't necessarily have a home address. Um, that is actually part of the beauty of it. Um, how many of you have been trying to turn in an assignment or a term paper, something like that, and all of a sudden you got a data problem on your computer where you stored that? So yeah, you, the one single user that was responsible for that data storage, you got a problem, and, and now we can't deliver whatever the deliverable was because we can't get at the data. That That is the beauty of a blockchain. It doesn't live anywhere, and everybody has it, and everybody has the exact same copy of it. It's almost like a Google Doc. Um, meaning that it is live, it is constantly evolving and changing because everybody can add data to it who is a participant. And also, in order to add data, you have to have somebody else agree to that as well, and that's what lets us verify that data. Um, so, yep, that's pretty much the answer to that one. Who can participate in it? Um, this answer isn't bad. Anyone that uses the program systems for the blockchains. Um, if you're in the blockchain, you can participate. Um, there, depending upon what blockchain we're talking about, there may be barriers for entry. Um, another really low hanging fruit example of that again is Bitcoin. Um, who can participate is the people who own Bitcoin. So the barrier to entry there beyond having the technology to drive it, of course, the barrier to entry is you got to own Bitcoin. Um, there you go. Okay. Under what conditions or circumstances can a person add to or manipulate data that's on this chain? This is one thing I, I was hoping to get a little bit better answers at. And, and some of you had some super specific examples. Um, so this student goes ahead and says, well, the farmer, the grain company that owns the elevator, the miller, probably any shippers in between all of this can certainly participate. Exactly right. What I, what I was hoping to hear is anybody who has been accepted into the blockchain can go ahead and participate. And then when can I manipulate that data? And one way to look at my definition of, and, and I was at trying to bait some of you into saying, okay, this may be one of the weak spots on it. As long as we've got users that agree on a data point, so we can go ahead and add it there. Um, 
I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but so I can provide you something of a concrete example. So if I'm in the cattle block chain, I can't just add a block out of the blue clear sky that says I sold calves for $2.87 a pound. Um, I need to have it verified that I had those calves to sell in the first place. But mostly to add that data with the timestamp on it and the conditions surrounding it, I have to have somebody come in and say, yeah, I bought those calves for $2.87 a pound. That may be difficult for a couple of reasons. You might have one person who has no need or desire to participate in the blockchain. Or I'm getting around to my point. The other side of that transaction or that ledger and that hopeful ledger entry is they may not want that data out there. Another way to put that is they may not want to fess up to how much they paid for a set of calves because now that becomes data that other participants in the blockchain can look at. They can't edit it, they can't change it, but they can sure look at it. Um, I think this is one of the soft spots in blockchain technology, so there we go. Um, is there any talk of creating a blockchain in your commodity, and what's the purpose of doing it? Um, again, I was trying to bait the hook a little bit to see what people thought all of this screaming and shouting was about. Um, uh, most of you came back with answers about, I want to be able to study or record better in depth and have better data available to me about what were the inputs that went into creating my commodity and how can I better track it? all the way through the system and, and see what happens to it. Maybe beyond, I want to see what happens to my commodity, uh, possibly far beyond when I actually sold it to somebody in this chain of events. So this was kind of cool. Um, not many people came back with, hey, I'm using this as a market data tool um, about what the value of the commodity is. So cool. Um, this student did a really great job to you. I'm going to fast forward you now to another one that has a completely different look. Um, so this student, um, I, I found this incredibly interesting because this student's actually coming out of the world of being an, uh, well, it's a crop nutrient supplier. So, I mean, the analogy would be the Wall Wall Farmers Co-op that's selling fertilizer and chemical or nutrient or McGregor Company, something along those lines. Um, and all of a sudden, we've got a really different slant on this. Instead of I'm producing a commodity, this student saying, no, I'm tracking the use and sale of something that actually definitely is a commodity. But I'm tracking the use of certain ver types of inputs that are going into these crops. Um, gave a really different perspective on things, and I think there's a whole bunch to be learned from what this student had to say. I was super excited reading through this one. I, I, I got a little bit out of hand here. So um, just agriculture supply chain, so good enough answer. I mean, perfect. And fact of the matter is the folks that are standing in this industry are probably going to be the ones that wind up leading the way on using blockchain technology. There is enough at stake and there is enough, well, as you're going to see in a minute, fertilizer flying around the country that they're in a spot to, hey, we, we need to formalize, simplify, make faster, make better the way we're tracking what fertilizer is going where. Um, so they've got a pile of stuff at stake. Also, this kind of, 
in a roundabout way ties back into some of that farm management software we were talking about a week or two ago. Um, this is actually taking, okay, what did XYZ Farmer in PDQ field apply when? Um, this is going to allow these ag supply companies to start tracking and putting it at a just a couple of mouse clicks away how much fertilizer went where when and why and what types and what were the conditions surrounding that and also it's just going to allow them at a moment's notice and without reams and reams of data that they got to go through to start making better informed decisions about what they need to do as a business. I, I mean, how, how much anhydrous ammonia do I need to buy or have under contract to satisfy what my customer needs are? When do I need it? Where? How far from my terminal is it going to have to be delivered to? Um, it's taking all of that data that used to live individually somewhere it was probably on some field man's cell phone, what they did two years ago. And all of a sudden that comes back into this blockchain that we can refer back to. It's never going to change. It's never going to get lost. It's never going to become corrupted or bad data. Um, it puts it at fingertip and it's super fast. And they can send information the other way as well they can send it out to their growers instead of at, at from the perspective i was giving you was just basically collecting data from growers now they can send information to them um really great answer right here the definition of blockchain technology is a shared immutable ledger um student goes on to say what the hell does immutable ledger mean that means once this data has been verified and put on a block or put out put out there, it's not going to change and it's not going to go away. And in point of fact, nobody can change it or edit it. Um, that is another thing that's part of the beauty of it. We, we don't have somebody saying, eh, that's not really what I want everybody else to be reading about. Once it's there, it's there. And even a system administrator, and there's not really such a thing as, a, as an administrator on a blockchain, they can't come in and change it. Like I said, the only way that's going to happen is if 50% plus one of the systems participating say that data is bad and we edit it. Is that ever going to happen? Um, so there's actually a decent amount of security built into this just by virtue of the fact of how it's made. Um, another thing that I thought was a good comment here, um, we're going to be able to track the process of a commodity from start to finish. Um, that actually is making a pretty good argument down the road for this traceability that our, a lot of our consumers are actually getting after. So yeah, sorry about the interruption there. I was going to have a hack and fit. And I also got to looking at my timer and I'm probably getting to the point where I'm going to make people's eyes roll back in their head. So I'm, I'm going to wrap this up for this session here really shortly. But um, I thought there was a couple really good comments right here. Um, it's able to record each transaction as a block of data. And then I think an equally great statement, each block goes with the previous transaction and the ones after it to show a chain of events. This is actually getting back to just what the core bedrock values of what a blockchain is. It's creating a string of things that we want to see. I think this entire next comment is awesome. I don't know if she necessarily meant it this way, but I think there's something to think about. Consumers think that they would like to know how their food got on their table. Um, I, I absolutely am in love with that comment. Um, there are a lot, a lot of our consumers that say, yeah, I want to know what's going into the food that I'm putting into my body. Um, 
I think for a lot of our customers, and, and before I even say this, the customer is always right, so we will roll with what they're asking for. I don't know if they're as interested as what they're really claiming to be. Um, that doesn't change anything that we are going to do as agriculture, and we are going to provide them every scrap of information that they want. Um, we don't have anything to hide. We do not need to be ashamed of anything that we're doing. Um, I think a lot of the information's going to get really boring really fast. Um, I don't think anybody's particularly interested on how long that load of NH3 set at a rail terminal. Um, and it, it's also not changing anything. The same as you haul a semi load of weed into whatever country elevator and it sits in a bin. And it sits there for a while longer. And then, I don't know, next spring sometime a truck comes along and picks it up and it ships it to another terminal where it's just waiting its turn to get on a barge or a rail deal. Um, I don't think a lot of that information is nearly as interesting as they thought it was going to be. Um, but, <laughs> to the student's point, all right, you want it? Here it comes. So I, I think that, that I kind of got a kick out of it when when I read that. So yeah, um, just to kind of finish this up. Oh, uh, yeah, not kind of finish this up. I, I'm past my half hour time limit here, but um, the student did a, a really good of job of using a concrete example of. Okay, I've got these different types of fertilizers. I'm going to throw a barcode at it. So now I now I can, you know, super easy, like, track this and what's going on. This barcode is just going to take me back to, you know, what is it? What, what are the conditions surrounding this one block of data in the chain? And, and it's going to be tied to a load of anhydrous somewhere um, but there was a really good point that came up in this and I, I think I'm going to cut to it pretty quickly and saying all right if I have a 500,000 gallon tank of solution 32 the that fertilizer supplier did absolutely nothing wrong, nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to hide by saying, yeah, I bought that stuff from four different suppliers because you know what? I supply a lot of farmers and I got a lot of truckloads of it leaving. It, it's coming and going on a daily basis. And herein lies one of the biggest challenges we've got. We've got that half a million gallon tank right there. There's fertilizer coming into it daily. There's fertilizer leaving it daily. We we lost a certain amount of traceability by that. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to point a finger at the fertilizer industry. In point of fact, here's another super concrete example. You have an XYZ feed yard somewhere. Their job is to feed cattle. So they go buy a semi-load at the top in a sale barn, and they buy another semi-load of cattle at the Grand sale barn, and they buy a semi-load of cattle at the Hermiston sale barn and bring a couple loads in from Lewiston. And these cattle all go into the same pen. Um, now, cattle may be not perfect example because I can individually identify cattle, but I can't individually identify a gallon of solution 32 in that half million gallon tank. So there's always going to be co-mingling and then splitting back out. Um, that is one of the things that we're going to have to um, come to some sort of peace with. Um, maybe we as an industry decide that, okay, maybe that co-mingling isn't that big of a deal. They're all the same product. It's all solution 32 that went in there. But uh, 
d does it matter that I know precisely what where that one began and, and where that one end, or, or it is the larger point that solution 32 was used. So, okay, great answer right there. Um, so where is this blockchain? Um, so another good answer doesn't fully exist yet. We're still building them. Um, and you're going to see some examples when I turn this camera on next time of, of some people that have some pretty robust blockchains that are up and going already. Um, most of those are actually going to be on the private side, not necessarily for public viewing yet. Um, another thing to think about. Okay, um, who can participate? Um, great answer right here. So we've got the public ones. There's Bitcoin. Um, there's a comment there about little security. That one, I think that depends upon your perspective. Um, there was also a lot of folks that came back with an answer that said the government can manipulate data on these blockchains. Um, by themselves, they can. However, they can regulate in the industry. I believe where we say there's little security um, is kind of a remnant with, with what's going on with cryptocurrency. And when they're saying there's no security there, there, that means that there are no governments standing behind what the value of one Bitcoin or one Ethereum is worth. Um, so the security in whatever the commodity may be seriously called into question. Just that's the same thing as saying what's the volatility of the wheat market today or the fuel market. Um, I, I think maybe that's what we got going on with not very much security. Um, so we've got private blockchains and so you're going to see an example coming up where Walmart has a blockchain or, or Albertson, Safeway, Kroger have some blockchains going on. Um, only people inside of their network are participating inside of that blockchain. Um, so that's private or um, permissioned. Uh, that would be another way of saying so an exa a concrete example of that may be Continental Grain owns whatever shipment of grain, but they send it through a flour mill, and the flour mill now gets to add a block to the chain that says, yep, I milled that, and I made XYZ type flour out of that. So the miller may be permissioned into adding data to the blockchain. Um, so right now, probably not going to see a ton of the public blockchains. I, I really believe that th that is coming. Okay. Um, done. Uh, we've talked about this one. So basically, it's all members of the network can go ahead and have a shot at adding data to a blockchain as long as somebody agrees to the data. Um, is there talk of creating a blockchain for your commodity? Um, some of you came back with the answer of, uh, I had one student come in with strawberries, and the answer was, well, not so much. But then you've got other examples of, yeah, we got some stuff going for wheat. We got some stuff going for hay. There's definitely some going on in the cattle industry. Or you're looking at it from a completely opposite perspective and say, yeah, we're working on it as far as fertilizer goes. So, cool. I'm going to shut it off at there for today. Um, 40 minutes of listening to me app about this is plenty enough. We'll have another visit about this Thursday, and I'll have a follow-up uh, assignment, which, again, is probably going to happen over a quiz just because it gives me some cool functionality. Thank you, folks.